Welcome. We are uh, going to be talking today about the difference between a preference and a conviction. There are two classes of beliefs, preferences and convictions. So we're going to look at that today. Government, the government of Israel was a theocracy, a theocracy. And let's learn a little bit more about what that means. The separation of church and state. The government of Israel was a theocracy. That is a government by God directly. When Israel and Judah repeatedly violated God's law and rejected his rulership, the Lord finally withdrew from them his direct government and left them to what they desired. Subjection to man. Thus they came under the successive dominion of Babylon, Medo-Persia, the Greek Empire, and finally Rome. Since then, there has been no government anywhere to which God has delegated the authority that he gave to the king of Israel in the days of the theocracy. The Bible teaches a separation of church and state. Matthew 22, 17 through 22. And therefore religious liberty for all. Earthly governments may not force the conscience. The conscience tells us what is right. So earthly governments may not do this. They may not force the conscience or usurp the place reserved to God alone in the theocracy of Israel. Not until the second coming of Christ will God again establish his theocracy. Until then, men must arrogate to themselves authority over the human conscience, must not arrogate the, to themselves authority over the human conscience that God has not entrusted to them. In the United States, like I had stated before, we have the Constitution of the United States and we have the First Amendment, which allows us freedom of religion. And that's why the United States has been uh, a glorious place to live because of that freedom, that religious freedom. But we're told in the last days that religious freedom would be taken away. And the United States would begin to speak like what kind of, what kind of a beast? A dragon. A dragon. Yes. So as of now, the United States still has religious freedom, but the um, especially in the area of education, the parents are following the state in that area and the church isn't really, as I see it, uh, educating the people like they should as to what your religious duty is in this area of education. We're putting our trust in the leaders and as in the days of Jesus, the leadership had swerved uh, off of the right path and was in subjection to man more than in subjection to God. So in the area of education, I just want to bring out to you that it is a religious duty. It is a religious duty for us as parents to educate our children God's way. All right. In Matthew 22, 17, tells us, Therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Verse 18, But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt me ye, uh, ye me, ye hypocrites? Number 19, Shew me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny, and he saith unto them, Who is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar. 
Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So this scripture you want to remember. Matthew chapter 22, 17 through 22. We want to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And so we have civil laws. We have laws in America where you have to drive on the roads the stated uh, speed. Uh, you have to, there's a manual for driving. You have to uh, read that manual and then you have to obey those rules. Those are civil laws. Also, you must get a marriage license. Marriage is an institution that God has given to us, but to make it clear to those uh, in the community, uh, they have you license, get a marriage license. So there are certain civil things that we are to be obedient to, and in the case of Caesar. But we must understand where the church and the state are separate. And when it comes to religious duties, then it becomes our obligation to God first to uh, obey those. And so, uh, as we've been here this past week, learning more about God's plan for education, as well as health, uh, we are learning that we must obey God rather than man, as stated in Matthew 22, 17 through 22. All right, what illustrates for us this division of church and state in the image that was given to King Nebuchadnezzar. And we have uh, the children have the felts. If I could have the children come up and line up here and I'll put you in order, all right, that I want you to put those felts on the board. So if all the children that have the felts could come up here and stand in a line. And then I will put you in order as they go on the board. <clears throat> the mingling of church craft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. Yes, just stay right here, all right, and just get into a line, and I'll take a look at what your felts are. <clears throat> this union is weakening all the power of the churches. So what is it? The mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. And as we put these felts on the board, I want you to identify where the iron and the clay is, okay? All right, let me see what you have. All right, let's, I want you to be one of the first. Don't put it on the board just yet. All right, there. And uh, let's see. You with the angel, come here. We'll let you go first. And another angel, yes, go right there. Good. And uh, let's go here. And let's see. The rock is at the very end. Okay, very end. And let's see. No, we want you to stay right there. Let's see. where. Who has the head? Okay, good. You come up here. And you'll stand right here and you come over here. Good. You'll be there and there. And then we need this part, Grisha, come right here. You need to back up a little bit. Good, good, good. And then the legs. Good. And then the feet. The feet. Mm -hmm. And now you, let's stand right here. Good. You're all standing in order. That's wonderful. That's our character quality this week, isn't it? Okay, let's see. We have room. Okay. Good. And uh, pagan room. I think, let's see. This will be first the pagan room and then paper room. Okay. And you can put that up next to this. Okay. Very good. And you're last. Very good. How do you like this order? Does this look nice? Good. All right. <clears throat> King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon and he had a dream. 
But he was so confused and in turmoil because he could not even remember the dream. And so he had his wise men and his magicians and his astrologers. He told them, you tell me the dream. And they said to him, no, you tell us the dream, then we'll tell you what it means. But he couldn't tell them the dream. And so he was really upset. And then someone came and told him that they knew who could tell the dream. Who was it that could tell the dream? Daniel. Daniel. This dream was found in the book of Daniel. We can read it. And so Daniel, he came to the king and he said, King, I cannot tell you the, the dream, but I will ask my God to give me the dream that you had and the interpretation. And so Daniel, he went, he prayed. And when he came back, God had given him the meaning of the dream. And so we're going to place the felts on the board, first of all, um, this stream is a part of the three angels' messages. We are to understand this because this is the history back there at Daniel's time. The history of the world was given to Daniel. And so this prophecy is very important for all of us to understand. All right, so let's go ahead. Let's put the three angels up here. Uh, quite, yes, quite high because um, the felts tend to fall off when they get a little lower. But yes, let go. Can you, can you reach up there and put those, that angel way up there? Good. These <clears throat> three angels uh, signify to us that um, the message that we're to give to the world is a powerful message. Are angels powerful? They are. They're very powerful. And so the message we're to give is represented by three angels. Thank you so much. The three, <coughs> the number three helps us be reminded that the power of these messages comes from the three in heaven, the three dignitaries, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what makes this message so powerful because it comes to us from the Godhead in heaven. And so that dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had, God was wanting to reach this king of Babylon with the truth. And so we gave him a very important message. Let's see what this King Nebuchadnezzar dreamt. And if we could put the head of gold right up here. He saw a head of gold. The uh, type of element is very important. Is gold precious? It is. It's one of the most precious and the most pure. In order for it to be pure, though, it must go through fire. And so we have gold representing to the king of Babylon the greatest of importance. So the greatest nation that has been, has been Babylon. All right, let's see. There was also in the book of uh, Revelation and Daniel, a beast also represented. So as your children are learning about these mammals, uh, in their family Bible lessons when they're young, they'll learn the characteristics of these beasts. And um, before sin, they were not wild. But now they are wild, aren't they? And so let's see what is the beast that is also represented by Babylon. Could you put that right here? All right, we have, what is it? What is this beast? A lion. A lion is considered the king of beasts. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he was quite impressed with this dream when he learned about it, that his nation was uh, the head of gold and the lion with wings. So children can be learning the characteristics of the lion today. The lion is also represented uh, by, uh, as Christ and, of course, the characteristics of a lion that are kingly uh, would be represented by Christ. But now that the lion is wild, 
we want to learn what those characteristics are because Satan was also represented as a lion, right? What kind of a lion? A roaring lion. And when a lion roars, what happens to the creatures? They become paralyzed. They just freeze. It's a very frightening thing. And so these kinds of things need to be discussed so that the illustrations that God has given us can stay with us and help us to remember. All right, what is the next nation? You have it there. It's represented by uh, a weaker element and it represents Medo-Persia. So in history, that was the next nation. And here is another illustration. See, God is using pictures for us to help us to understand more about these nations. All right, could you put up the next one? So it's important to learn the characteristics of these beasts. Good, that's, mother's gonna help you. Very good. Oh yes, and it looks like a leopard with wings and many heads. All right, the head is the one that controls. So it looks like there are many that are controlling that leopard. I know when I started drawing pictures of the book of Revelation and these beasts, my leopard looked like a little kitty cat. No, leopards are not that way. So to understand better the characteristics of these beasts, you'll understand better the characteristics of the rulers of these nations. All right, so this particular element was weaker. So we can see the nations became weaker and weaker. All right, you can put the legs up. And each of these elements and each of these beasts represented the next nations that ruled the world. So we have pagan Rome, and then we have the feet. <clears throat> Very good, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And then what do you have? You have a rock. That's right. Who's the rock? Christ. We're told that this rock is going to come and it's going to hit the feet, right? And the feet are made up of what? Iron and clay. When you put iron and clay together, what, what happens? Do, does it hold together very well? It doesn't. Very easy is it going to crumble when that rock comes and hits it. And these feet represent, the iron and the clay represent church craft and state craft mingled. And it represents other things as well, but I want to point out to you the weakness of the nation in which we live down here. This is where we are in the history of the world. We're down here at the feet. Jesus is ready to come and he's saying to us, fall now on the rock, Christ Jesus. Be broken. In other words, don't be following man because if you're following man, when that rock comes, you will not have a sure foundation. The sure foundation is Christ and his methods, his ways, and we want to be following him. So this I want you to remember the, the feet, where we are in Earth's history. Churchcraft and statecraft mingled. It reminds me also of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, we were told, stay away from it. Leave it alone, as I learned this morning. Leave it alone. Don't go near it. Because it is what is weakening the nations the combination of churchcraft, good and evil. God only intended for us to learn the right, the good. He never wanted us to learn evil. Thank you, children, very much for helping with the illustrations. Churchcraft and statecraft. The image revealed to Nebuchadnezzar while representing the deterioration of the kingdoms of the earth in power and glory 
also fitly represents the deterioration of religion and more morality among the people of these kingdoms. As nations forget God, in like proportion, they become weak morally. And we see this in the church today, a weakness in the moral, um, the character of our people. And so we want to be building that back, strengthening um, the strengthening it so that it once again God calls it in the book of Revelation gold the gold of faith and love that's the strength that will make you if you want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven it will make you strong it will make you pure and make you valuable as well <clears throat> the false system of education with just learning the facts just be getting a career uh, leaves you weak, weaker than if you learned right along with the spiritual, the facts, then it would continuously remind you that you are dependent upon God for everything. And everything then that you look upon will be a reminder that He is your strength. He is the one who gives you the purity and um, <clears throat> and all that is good, it comes from him. So Babylon, Babylon passed away because in her prosperity, she forgot God and ascribed the glory of her prosperity to human achievement. And it's a very interesting story to learn. After this dream was given, or vision was given to Nebuchadnezzar, what did he do? Did he illustrate it like God had given it to him? No. Instead, he had a statue, I believe it was like 60 feet, if I'm not mistaken, and it was pure gold. He didn't want his nation to be overcome. He wanted to be the greatest, and it was very hard for him to believe that there was going to be another nation that came in. Um, after him. And so we learn that King Nebuchadnezzar had to be humbled by God. How did God humble King Nebuchadnezzar? He, he made him like a beast uh, and he had to go out and he ate grass. For how many years? Uh, seven, seven years. years. The number of perfection. Seven years. You know, when people get cancer, when people have these diseases that uh, doctors today don't have a way to cure. Uh, many, especially at Uchi Pines, put you on wheatgrass, barley grass, greens, greens, green, the, the uh, color of faith and hope, greens, grass. I ate it for many years. Wheatgrass, I would take wheatgrass tablets when my blood sugar would be going down. I had severe blo blood sugar, low blood sugar, and I would uh, have to take off walking. I'd have panic attacks, and I'd put eight to ten uh, tablets of wheatgrass in my mouth and chew them up, and it would help my blood sugar. So grass, God is wanting to humble us. He wants us to humble ourselves and believe what he's saying to us to do and to do it by faith. Not because everyone else is doing it, not because it's popular, but because he said, this is my way, this is my divine plan. Because when you are humbled by God, like King Nebuchadnezzar having to eat grass for seven years, he came out of it convicted, converted. I. It helped to convict and convert me. But do I want to go back to eating grass? No, now I have learned to love to eat my leaves, my lettuce, my, um, my greens. I love it because of the strength that it gives to me. Um, but no longer do I have to, because my body becomes out of control, um, do I have to eat that uh, barley grass or wheat grass. <clears throat> so Babylon, Lost, It passed away because in her prosperity she forgot God. <clears throat> Represented by the head of gold. 
Medo-Persia, the Medo-Persian kingdom was visited by the wrath of heaven because in this kingdom God's law was trampled underfoot. The fear of the Lord found no place in the hearts of the people. The prevailing influences in Medo-Persia were wickedness, blasphemy, and corruption and it passed away. It was visited by God's wrath. And we're told in the books of Daniel and Revelation that once again, the cities especially will be visited by the wrath of God. This earth and the heavens will be shaken in the end because of the wickedness, the blasphemy, and the corruption. Now is the time to fall on the rock before the rock comes and crushes all that is living in disobedience to God. Medo-Persia, represented by the arms and the breasts of the image, a weaker element than gold. Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, the kingdoms that followed were even more base and corrupt. They deteriorated because they cast off their allegiance to God. As they forgot him, they sank lower and still lower in the scale of moral value. It's the moral value that we're looking at because not only in um, Rome, papal Rome and pagan Rome, um, did we see this, but also in the churches today represented by these uh, feet of iron and clay, the mingling of the church craft and the state craft have given us a form of godliness. We might go to church, and as we lear learn a little bit further about preferences versus conviction, we might look like a Christian in almost every way. But if our beliefs are not convictions, then it will only be a form. We will have no power, no power, and when Jesus comes, he will say to so many, I never knew you, depart from me. And they'll say, but I did so many good things for you. But he will say, I never knew you. So it's so important for us to understand what it means to know God. And true education is all about knowing him. John 17, 3, for this is life eternal, that they might know me, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the Lord. God wants us in our education not to forget him, but to remember him. And so the association of here, we're even getting an uh, indication of how the elements, how the beasts can be illustrations for us to better understand what God is trying to show us in this dream. The vast empire of Rome crumbled to pieces and from its ruins rose that mighty power, the, Ro <coughs> excuse me, the Roman Catholic Church. This church boasts of her infallibility and her hered hereditary religion, but this religion is a whore to all who are acquainted with the secrets of the mystery of iniquity. The priests of this church maintain their ascendancy by keeping the people in ignorance of God's will, as revealed in the scriptures. Now this is history, but it is also in every denomination today. There are priests, even in the day of Jesus, in the Jewish religion, the priests had departed from God's true way. And so we have to look at all of the churches today and the leadership of today and compare it with God's true plan. Are we being led in the, the proper way? Um, there will be no excuse for those of us who sit on the pews. No excuse. My pastor told me. My priest told me. He said, they said, that is not good enough. Jesus came. He showed us. It is written is to be the answer. It is written. What does God say? What does God think? That's what we want to stand on. That's the rock. And that's what will help us be seen through the end of time, through the time of trouble, and so forth. Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, <clears throat> they became more base and corrupt. 
And we must learn from history because in these feet, the tin toes, the uh, iron and the clay, we see that it's throughout, it has come, gone throughout Christendom, this mingling of churchcraft and statecraft. What is the church? What is the church? The church is not the building. The church is not the name. It is the beliefs and the believers. The beliefs and the believers make up the church. <clears throat> what is the wall that separates the church from the state? <clears throat> the First Amendment in the United States Congress may, shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. And so the First Amendment, we're told that our Constitution in the United States and this First Amendment will no longer be um, held up by our court system. But even still, we must, if our beliefs, our convictions, no matter what, we will be willing to die because of our beliefs. <clears throat> Only if your beliefs are convictions will you be willing to die. Your beliefs are you must somehow make your beliefs oral. When you go into a courtroom in the United States in regards to especially education, you must make your beliefs uh, known orally. You must have a knowledge of your beliefs. In the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the United States, there are only two types of beliefs. One is a preference, the other is a conviction. A preference is and can be a strong belief, but it will change under some circumstances. You may be in full-time ministry, you may give all your wealth to it, you may have, um, you may be energetic and hand out tracts, attend all the meetings. You may want your children, or you want to teach it to your children, and you may be zealous. And it's still, your beliefs might be a preference because you're willing to change. These are some circumstances that might make you change what you believe. Peer pressure. Being around your peers, they're doing something different. You look odd to them, peculiar, and so they want you to come along and do what they want. This reminds me of the home of Jesus. He was homeschooled, but he had other siblings. And we're told that the other siblings, they like to get into mischief. They wanted Jesus to be a part of that mischief, but Jesus would say no. Jesus at a young age had convictions. His beliefs were convictions. Peer pressure could not change his beliefs. Might be family pressure. M the mother of Jesus and, and Joseph, they were oftentimes asked by rabbis, put your son in our school. They could see that he was more uh, gifted, he was intelligent, he knew a lot more than the scribes and Pharisees and they wanted the credit. But Jesus would not go. Jesus would have been unfitted if he would have gone to those schools for his mission. And if Jesus would have been unfit for his mission and did not accomplish it for us, where would we be today? Family pressure would not change conviction in that home. Also a lawsuit. Well, what if you are taken to court and uh, you might be put in jail or prison? What if you might lose your life? What if you lose your children? Will you stand? You will stand only if others stand with you. If these things will change the way that you believe, then your beliefs are only preferences. 
so what is a conviction? A conviction in the United States is the only thing that is protected by the Constitution. So if the court can get you to change your, the way you believe, especially in the area we're speaking of, of education, then <clears throat> you are not protected. So in my case, I was convicted. I had been educated as to these things. And uh, so I was not intimidated. I was not afraid of what would happen to me or my children. Um, and so my answers were from the Bible. Um, they were my convictions. And uh, it was upheld in the court. And so my children were not taken away. Um, and uh, God did protect me. But as our rights are being taken away, um, then more and more people will uh, lose their children. They will um, go to prison, we're told. Uh, our um, state, our nation will begin to speak like a dragon. And so this is another reason for us to be doing God's plan for our children in case they are taken away. And we have many uh, stories in the Bible of those that were taken away from their homes, Daniel and his three friends were one. Joseph was taken away from his home. That early training prepared them. Even Moses. Moses was with his family for the first 12 years of his life. God protected him in the most important years when the foundation of their destiny was to be set. And so Moses did come back. He had to have the retraining, re-education, 40 years. 40 years. So it's easier to learn God's way than to learn the other way and then have to be retrained. We can see much of this from the Bible lessons. So conviction is the only thing protected by the Constitution, a belief that you will not change, not something you discover. It's not something you discover, it's something you have evidence for and that's what the Word of God is. It is our evidence. God's Word doesn't change. It's not something you discover. You purpose in your heart, like Daniel chapter 1. That's what saw him through the years that he was in Babylon. And he was raised from uh, coming in and um, going through their education to the prince over all the other princes with the, the moral character of Jesus Christ. Your children will be put in positions uh, of authority and leadership where they can uh, be representatives for God in mighty ways. So to think that God's education plan is inferior to the world's is a wrong belief, a wrong understanding. And so these things have to be cleared up and the only way they can be cleared up is if we study to find out uh, if this is true, so that they can, our beliefs can become convictions. A conviction is non-negotiable. If someone was going to give you houses and lands and position and money, uh, you, you cannot be bribed. Um, working in ministry the last 12 years, I've been offered two homes. I um, have been given uh, a couple of cars. Um, I just kept asking the Lord, do you want me to work in ministry? Uh, that's the most important thing to me, that I get what you have taught me out to your people so that someone, if I can help one person, uh, that's what I'm here for. The material things in this world are not what is first and foremost and of utmost importance. We see in Joseph's life and Moses' life, they had uh, all that they needed. And um, the first thing that we want to do is to live like Jesus. He lived to bless others. And Jesus himself had no place to lay his head. That is not what we're here to do, is to gain um, things. Nothing wrong with having properties and, um, and institutions and so forth. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, first and foremost is your beliefs, your convictions. Uh, so that when you are put into responsible positions and you are running, helping to run um, businesses uh, for God, ministries, you will know how to um, handle 
uh, the properties and the finances because you have that moral character. Okay, and not keeping my belief is a sin. So you must believe that your beliefs, if you don't keep them, are a sin. That is a conviction. And um, God says that there will be a people that return to primitive godliness. They will be settling into the truth, settled into the truth. They will know what they believe, and they will have and hold these beliefs as convictions. Nothing will be able to um, change their beliefs. True Christian education, is it a preference or is it a conviction? If you understand it to be a religious duty, then it must become a conviction. Here is a, uh, on our screen over here, a group uh, in one of our lifestyle educator trainee classes it was all young people. There usually is a mix of ages from 17, 18, all the way up to 65, 70. Uh, in this group, they were all young, and in um, many respects, that's one of the harder classes to reach uh, if they have not been rightly trained before, before coming to an institution like Uchi Pines. So this was a, a hard class to reach and to work with. Uh, many times young people will group together and uh, if they don't agree with what is being taught then they will resist it and um, so I ask that you would pray for each of these young people one of these young people is Lydia LaJule's brother and he is the only one from this class that continued to take the lifestyle counselor course which is a year long and he is the only one in his class uh, taking that course. So um, he needs our prayers as well. Our young people need our prayers. They need our guidance. If we think that um, we're doing them a service by sending them to a school outside the home, many times if they are not rightly trained, it is a real detriment to them. Um, we have students that come and live in the dorm, and I don't believe that a dormitory is a place uh, for our students. I believe they should, like in the Madison School that E.A. Sutherland started, that became a spectacle to the world. He had small little cottages for the students and they prepared their own meals. They had worship though with the professor. Um, dormitories are not, I don't believe, a uh, part of God's design. And we have many. We have a dormitory for the ladies. We have many that have been almost raised in dormitories. Um, they're at a real disadvantage. Uh, families are what God has placed our children in, mothers and fathers that love and care for them, reprove them, correct them, guide them, help them, encourage them to uh, know God. And then if they need to go for further education, then a place like Uchi Pines is a good place for them because if they do not have the same beliefs and so many come and have to learn so much that they never learned before, it's almost overwhelming to them. And this is why God is telling us to be teaching our young ones. I didn't learn about dress reform until my uh, daughter was about six, seven years old. And so she was wearing shorts, short sleeves, and little skimpy bathing suits and things like that. And now I'm learning, oh no, you've got to dress her more <coughs> modestly. And so it was how I introduced that to her, how I made it a delight, like the way you feel when you see a flower. And at the same time, teaching the health principles behind it. And, um, and then showing her how to make her own clothes because it is not that easy to go and find modest clothes on the racks um, where clothes are sold. And I've spent a lot of years searching in thrift stores um, for clothes and uh, the Lord has just kept, he kept leading me back to sewing. Sew your own clothes, sew your own clothes. And uh, once you have a wardrobe, you don't have to have so many clothes and um, and 
It's just so much easier. God's ways are so much simpler and easier for us and are a protection for us and a blessing when we learn them. So I'm just trying to encourage you with your young people, teach them all that you can. And if you don't know, which I didn't know a lot of these things, as I learned as a parent, I would teach my children. And then we would go to meetings like this and we would learn more. And so God has promised you, each one of you, you don't need the speakers, you need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. It's a promise. So you plead for the Holy Spirit and you study with all your heart and utilize the things, the tools that God is blessing you with at, down here at the end of time and you will be blessed, I know. What is on the outside is on the inside. So what we see on the outside is on the inside. If we are not dressing neatly and orderly, then our minds are usually not neat and order. If our homes on the inside are not neat and orderly, our minds and hearts are usually that way. So this is an area like we are learning this week. Once again, we're learning about orderliness. So we want to encourage that in the home. And I, I am so thankful for these character qualities that we get to focus on every week. It's not just for the young, it is for all of us as well. All right, this is another class uh, at Uchi Pines. You can see the different ages. Um, we have in the center a um, pastor, and then uh, to the uh, left of him, yes, uh, a lady from uh, Barbados, and she was an educator her whole life. And she uh, was very interested in learning about health so that she could go back to her country and teach them their health principles. And also she learned about true education. And uh, in all the years of her education and her training, she did not learn many of these principles. And so she was very pleased that God sent her to Uchi Pines to learn more. And then we have some young people there uh, once again, learning the medical missionary work, learning how to be helpers in this line of health. And then we have two gentlemen. Um, one uh, actually did not finish. Many times, like I said before, students come um, and they haven't had previous training in uh, many areas and they have many defects, many weaknesses, and sometimes the training is too much for them. So they leave, we pray for them, and um, uh, it may be years before they come back, or God may have to lead them another way. I know for myself, when I was a young person, 17, 18 years old, I was very interested in medical missionary work, and I uh, tried to get into a number of places, and the Lord has taken me around uh, in my life to see that he was the one who was leading me. And now that I'm at Uchi Pines, I don't necessarily have a desire to go through the course there because God has taken me through a course. And I have um, maybe not some of the scientific um, information, but I have the practical experience that when you learn, fr learn from a book, uh, you don't get until you actually begin to apply it and get that practical experience. So we can help each other, we can learn from each other, and that's the beauty of God's family. And this is a picture that you've seen um, on the screen before. Th these are some of the families that were at Uchi Pines. I've been there for four years now, and my mission has been to help families especially learn God's true way of education. And the Boutte family is not in here, sorry to say. I don't know if they were actually gone already, but um, they uh, are still part of uh, our Uchi Pines family uh, that learned a lot together. Um, but I wanted to show you uh, these families. The one family, I believe it is on the far left, I can't really see, the Meinhardt family, he was the education director and uh, he took his family, I believe, to Idaho and they're traveling all over the United States with their family of four children now. And um, 
and teaching uh, health and true education principles and they have applied them also in their home. Then there's um, myself and this Russian family. They're actually going to Russia, uh, I believe in the next month, to put on a one-month school and teach health principles there. They're both lifestyle counselors. They have been through, I believe, Uchi Pines or Wildwood. And then next to them is a couple that are uh, serving now in Serbia, is it? Croatia, Croatia, and they have actually translated a number of the Spirit of Prophecy Ellen White books in the area of health into their language, and they're doing health uh, work there. And the other family went for a year to India and uh, taught health principles there and uh, true education. They're practicing in their home, and now they're, I believe, in the States. So each of us, it says here, must make our beliefs a conviction, something that cannot be changed. So don't tell me about your faith. Show me your faith. Faith is action. And so your beliefs, uh, as I was told by my attorney when I had to go through a court setting, um, my attorney told me, just be honest and um, because I not only could tell her my beliefs, but I could show her that I was living out those beliefs. And so this Jewish attorney uh, was able, in such an eloquent way, describe uh, to the judge um, what true education was to me, and it being a conviction, he said, well, we don't need to hear it in court. Uh, what a miraculous event that was for me. So don't tell me about your faith, show me your faith in action. You know, when a crisis happens, um, that is not when the man is made. So when the time of trouble happens, there will be no time for you to get ready for it. God has been telling us for a long, long time, get ready, get ready, get ready. And he also has said, educate, 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 warning signs all around. It will be too late when the crisis hits. So today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to put into practice the things that you have learned. Never seen a man made by a crisis. A crisis exposes the man. And so in that crisis, the time of trouble, that's when you will have already developed patience, responsibility, punctuality, generosity, all these beautiful character qualities of God. And so now is the time to behold those character qualities and the things that we see that God has made as well as his word. So we are to fight in victory. I found a little coral piece. I saw one of the children had it yesterday in the shape of a V. And when I, I saw that, I said, oh, I want that coral piece. I want to be reminded of victory. We need to fight in victory because Jesus, yes, has won. The battle is still on, though. And so as we fight, allowing God to fight the battles for us, but as we put, allow Jesus to put on his robe of, uh, this beautiful robe of his character, then we can fight in victory. And we can stand in victory. We can stand in victory. Christian education is a conviction of mine. And that's why I can stand before you today and I pray that God will give me the ability to stand no matter uh, what the battles are ahead in victory because Jesus has led the way and I'm convinced that he wants our children to be educated his way. And we have so many demonstrations and illustrations in nature of families. Families that show us God's true method of education. May God bless you. It has been a blessing to be here, to meet you, uh, to be a part of what God wants for you 
and to see the growth, one of our members said, you know, when we first start these meetings, it, it just doesn't seem like, you know, we're getting through or you're understanding. But to see especially the families up here and um, trying, God only asks us to try to do our very best and he will do the rest, but he wants you to just put to the stretch all of your energy. So it's wonderful and thrilling to us to see that you are grasping and understanding um, these precious messages. All right, let's have a word of prayer to close. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for guiding us we know that we are living in a time when it is so easy to forget you because of possibly the way that we've been trained or we get so busy that <clears throat> we forget to commune with you and that you are the one who gives us the strength to do all the good that we do so i pray that you would continue to help educate us your way each one of us no matter what the age uh, is you want to help us to see your beauty your character to see uh, when we don't follow you what the character is of um, especially the nation the great nation in the United States what it will be like the, the a dragon will speak like a dragon and it will become universal father in he heaven help us today to hold on to that cord of faith that green cord that you said would grow larger and larger as we near the end may we practice that faith today so that it can grow larger i thank you for being here for teaching us and for promising that you would lead us into all truth fill us with your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.